What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of exciting news to go over here this week. And this week I'm actually in LA for the LA Auto Show here, hence the you know hotel room. But what that does mean is that it's gonna be some actual in-person footage here for some of these debuts. And it's been really fun being at the auto show again. First auto show for me since uh, 2019 actually. So pretty awesome to be back here. And so anyway, as far as some of the debuts, now I already covered some of them. If you're a subscriber, you already know I posted videos on the Prius, uh, the other Toyota BZ concept that they brought and also the Subaru Impreza for 2024. So you can go watch those videos. They will also be in the playlist here. So if you let this video play till the end, which is always appreciated, uh, then you will be able to see those videos in the playlist. They'll just play automatically and you'll get caught up on everything from this week. But anyway, getting into the other debuts here this week, Porsche has has revealed the 2023 911 Dakar and so it's based on the GTS trim and it's three liter twin turbo boxer six cylinder that does 473 horsepower and 420 pound-feet of torque it'll still do a 3.2 seconds 0 to 60 which is only 0.1 seconds slower than a GTS despite all the off-road gear that this thing has and speaking of that off-road stuff the Dakar gets an almost two inch lift as standard but the beefed up height adjustable suspension can extend it to up to a 3.15 inch lift uh, but still that only provides you with seven and a half inches of ground clearance which is less than even most mild off-road crossovers uh, but it still is a nice improvement for the 911 you know but uh, just you know means that it's not going to be quite as capable as maybe they're marketing it to be uh, but they do say it's very very impressive with what it can do and they did change the bumpers for better approach and departure angles and all that kind of stuff as well uh, but other things here so uh, it gets a Pirelli all-terrain tire for a better traction off-road um, but those tires do limit the top speed to just 150 50 miles per hour now still pretty good for an off-roader uh, but you know much less than other 911s it of course has all-wheel drive as standard and it's been reinforced with upgraded differentials to handle the extra abuse that the new rally mode and off-road modes introduce there's also a rally launch control now for launching on loose you know uh, surfaces and surprisingly they also uh, were worried about keeping the weight down so it gets the gt3's uh, carbon fiber reinforced plastic hood carbon fiber bucket seats rear seat delete and lightweight glass to help it weigh only 16 pounds more than a GTS. But if you don't care about saving a few pounds, the more comfortable 18-way sports seats are available as an option as well, thankfully. It also gets engine mounts from the GT3, rear-wheel steering, and the dynamic chassis control system to help minimize body roll. Interestingly, the brakes are downsized compared to a uh, regular GTS, so it has Carrera S brakes instead because they claim that the GTS's bigger brakes aren't needed with the lower top speed. But if it accelerates as fast as the GTS, then I would assume that people would want it to slow down as fast as the GTS as well. Obviously, the tires will limit your braking abilities a little bit as well. But still, it just seems strange. They say that also made it lighter. Not sure, you know, um, if I totally, you know, understand that. But anyway, um, that's what they decided to do here for it. And lastly, it gets the intercooler from the Turbo S, since that uh, intercooler, I suppose, it can be mounted in a safer position than the regular 911 intercoolers. Um, and so I'm sure you also get some better cooling, uh, you know, with that uh, Turbo's hardware instead. And so that also is, I'm sure, a nice improvement, especially for off-road environments where it's a little bit hotter. Having the better cooling of the Turbo, you know, I'm sure certainly helps. So that's, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense there. And then also there's a bunch of other fun stuff you can uh, see on this. So it gets unique bumpers, spoiler, fender flares, tow hooks, and even stainless steel underbody guards. And you also, as far as options go, you can get a roof basket, a roof tent, and even extra lights that plug into the shark fin antenna if you want. And if you really want to go crazy, you can also uh, get a rally design package to make it look like the 1984 rally car that it pays homage to. To. And although it's based on the $151,000 GTS, the Dakar starts at $223,450. And considering only 2,500 of these things are going to be built for the entire world, that is likely just a starting point um, for all these dealer markups. Now, maybe there is one decent Porsche dealer in the country that'll sell this thing for actual MSRP, but chances are most places will be marking these things up even beyond that, which is crazy. Um, I know Porsche can really do no wrong at this point and every single thing they put out, especially the limited production stuff like this, is guaranteed to be a gold mine that'll probably be worth oodles of dollars for whatever reason. But I mean, this thing's really cool, but you know, is it $75,000 cooler than a regular 911? Maybe if you're super into the Safari thing in the 911 world. Um, 
but yeah, I don't know. And I feel like even those people would probably be, you know, not super excited about, you know, thrashing their brand new things. So how, who knows how many of the things are actually going to go off road. I feel like you're going to get an old beat up 911 Safari if you actually do want to, you know, do some abuse to it. So, um, I don't know. And uh, I mean, this is also way more expensive than even like a, a brand new GT3. And I feel like even if you're a huge Porsche lover, you're probably going to rather have a GT3 over this thing, even though it's cool. Um, you know, it's just, it's tough, but I'm sure it's for, it's meant for the people who already have a GT3 and 15 other Porsches, and this one will be parked alongside the others just for kicks. Um, so anyway, uh, very cool to see that though. And, uh, you know, this is starting to become a growing trend. We know Lamborghini is going to have their off-road based Huracan here coming relatively soon as well. And so, you know, it's, uh, interesting to see how this trend develops here in the coming years. Uh, moving on here though, Genesis has debuted the X convertible concept in LA and sadly it is just a concept. Uh, but hopefully someday all three of these X uh, Genesis uh, concepts will be shown. You know, they had the, uh, you know, speed back version and their normal coupe and now it's convertible. So hopefully all three of them get built someday. Um, and uh, they just look amazing. They look so good in person. It was really nice. They had the Speedium coupe there as well in LA in addition to the convertible and they both just look so, so good. And, you know, I feel like this is also an easy flagship because, especially if it's going to be electric, you know, you can just port over the same thing you have in the Kia EV6 GT and it has almost 600 horsepower in that already. Just toss that in there. I know it's, you know, a little more complicated than that, but seriously, I mean, it's a lot easier than doing some bespoke engine or some crazy different unique powertrain. You know, just swapping in that ordinary electric stuff, I think would be plenty of punch for this thing and it just would be a rolling masterpiece. That would really be a great halo model, I think, for Genesis. So hopefully someone can approve those things within Genesis and get those things actually produced. But it was really cool to see the, elect the uh, convertible version here at the show and um, very, very, very pretty looking car. Um, speaking of other Hyundai electric stuff though, they brought the US version of the Ionic 6 to LA. And aside from the orange side marker lights, you know, it's the same car I covered in a weekly update, you know, earlier this year. But Hyundai did reveal the US specific specs for it though. So here's those. Just like we suspected, it basically mirrors the Ionic 5 setup, starting with a low volume base model that only does 149 horsepower and 258 pound-feet of torque, along with a small 53 kilowatt hour battery. But this model really just seems to be basically existing to advertise a low starting price. Uh, the first mainstream trim that will actually be built in decent numbers um, will be a rear wheel drive big battery version, just like the Ionix. It uses the same 77.4 kilowatt hour battery as the Ionic 5. And this one uh, will do 225 horsepower along with that same 258 pound-feet of torque. And that one does a very impressive 340 miles of EPA rated range on a full charge, they're saying, um, which is much better than the 303 miles of range that the Ionic 5 maxes out at. This is mostly thanks to the much better aerodynamics, of course, having a very low 0.22 drag coefficient. And then at the top of the lineup for now is an all-wheel drive version that does 320 horsepower and 446 pound-feet of torque, again, just like the Ionic 5. It'll do 0 to 60 in less than 5 seconds, but also drops the range to 310 miles because uh, of that extra power. Power. There also will probably be an N version someday that is going to have nearly 600 horsepower, just like the Kia EV6 GT and the coming Ionic 5N. Uh, you know, and they already teased you know that Ionic 6N in a way, and so it's a pretty safe bet that a slightly toned down version of that you know will be coming eventually. It's just again, it's a copy and paste thing. It's so easy to do, and so there's really no reason not to. So um, you know, but that'll be great whenever that does come as well. And being on the same great 800 volt electrical system as the Ionic and the EV6 also means it'll have impressive recharge times of 10% to 80% charge in just 18 minutes, which is really one of the best uh, times out there. And the Ionic 6 also is gonna be debuting a new navigation software that can now plan charging stops along your route. And they say it'll be smart enough to actually skip stations that are currently full or broken. Um, which sounds great in theory. We'll see if it actually is that good at doing that because I feel like that's going to be kind of tough to do, but hopefully it can do that reliably. That would be awesome. And if it, you know, this does end up being successful, I'm assuming this will also roll out to the Ionic 5 and the EV6 uh, down the road as well. And uh, one thing that does seem to be exclusive to the 6 for now is the electric active sound design that they say uses an acoustic design processor to provide unique driving sounds inside the cabin and the ability to set the volume. Uh, they haven't shown off what those sounds will sound like yet, um, but you know it sounds like it's just going to be interior based. Uh, but still, will be kind of fun. We'll see what they let you uh, you know use as far as sounds go. And one last thing I'll add is that I also got to sit in it, and I was surprised at how spacious the back seat was. 
I couldn't really tell from the you know previous press pictures we saw earlier this year, but sitting in it, I mean, it's got about as much space as a Sonata in the backseat, at least from my quick little uh, you know observation there. So uh, I'm just happy to say that it's you know going to actually be a usable large vehicle and actually have a bigger backseat than stuff like the Taycan and stuff. It seems uh, the trunk also looked to be pretty nice and big too, and uh, so. I'm just glad that it's going to be pretty spacious. It's a super cool interior too, the way it's set up. And so I'm excited to do a full review on one hopefully next year. And uh, anyway, yeah, it'll be arriving at U.S. dealers in the spring, but there's no pricing uh, available for it yet. So that'll come, you know, at a later date here. And then the last little bit of Hyundai Group news is that we also got the U.S. details on the 2024 Seltos uh, from Kia after the design was already revealed in Korea earlier this year. Uh, and so I already covered it previously, but you know, it's a nice refresh and the new X-Line trim makes it look a little more rugged as well and it gets some great tech improvements inside as well with the 10.25 inch gauge cluster now joining the 10.25 inch infotainment screen and one combined housing there and another nice improvement is a good 20 horsepower bump in power just like the Kona got now doing 195 horsepower and 195 pound feet of torque when you go up to those top turbo trims the base engine that's naturally aspirated is still sticking around that's been revised slightly too but it only gains one more horsepower um, so anyway it'll be arriving in the middle of 2023 and there's no pricing for those yet either. Fiat used the auto show here to announce that they will be bringing the 500e to the U.S. Uh, in 2024. And the cars they showed here were the European version. They said the U.S. version will actually be debuting at next year's LA show, but it'll basically be the same, I'm assuming, aside from orange side marker lights. I'm not sure why they're holding off on that, but it'll so likely do the same 117 horsepower and 162 pound-feet of torque uh, as the European version, along with you know having the 42 kilowatt hour battery pack that they have over there. And Fiat did confirm though that for the US version here, it will get the same 85 kilowatt uh, charging and a uh, range of over 150 miles. I believe on the WLTP test cycle, which is much more generous, I think it's rated at 199 miles. So I think 150 is conservative, even with EPA's you know, harder testing. I could see this thing at least doing you know, 175, maybe 170 miles of range, which would be you know, significantly better than 150 even. And uh, you know, so pretty good considering you know, the competitors like the base you know, Nissan Leaf and even like you know, the Mini Cooper SE does you know, like 110 miles of range. I think the base Leaf is like 150 or so. So if this is over 150, that'd be pretty good considering this is, at least in Europe, it's priced at a, a lower price point than both the Mini Cooper SE and the base Nissan Leaf in Europe. So if it comes in under Nissan Leaf pricing for this little thing, I think it actually will be really great. And their presentation was pretty interesting too because they said that Fiat is already the number one best-selling Stellantis brand in general globally and that the 500e is already the best-selling EV this year in Italy and it's also currently the best-selling EV in other markets as well like they were showing there. And so uh, they honestly said they didn't need to bring the 500e here. They don't need to care about America at all for Fiat in general because they're already like the top dog um, in Europe. But they believe that it's the right thing to do for the planet to bring the 500e here. And so that's they're doing it because they want to, not because they need to, they said. Um, and if they can manage to, again, keep that pricing nice and low, I think it'll be a great little, you know, affordable commuter EV for those urban and suburban drivers, you know, that have another car for road trips or are okay renting a car for the one or two weeks out of the year they actually go on a long road trip. Um, you know, I think that it makes a lot of sense for people that are <laughs> reasonable with what they actually do with their driving habits. Obviously, if you live in a place where you're driving 100 miles a day, you know, back and forth to work, it might not make as much sense. But, you know, they're going to focus their... Um, you know, sales, they say in 2024 on those urban and suburban areas that they showed on the map there. And, uh, you know, for those settings, I think it will make a lot of sense if, you know, you're someone who can just live with, you know, less than 500 miles of range in your, in your vehicle. I think it'll be a very good uh, option for pragmatic buyers like that. And um, so uh, they also said that, um, you know, there's um, going to be I think reservation is going to open up here sometime in uh, like late 2023, whenever they debut it next year at the auto show. And then they said early 2024 is when they will start arriving in the States here. And hopefully we will be getting the fun Abart version as well, which um, they're going to be debuting in Europe next week. And so if they're bringing the regular one here, it stands to reason that they, there's no reason to not bring the Abart here as well, which like I mentioned last week, I'm very excited. You know, hopefully that'll be a lot of fun and, uh, you know, give even more power and uh, it'd be a great little, you know, fun electric option for those out there who, you know, don't want to be spending $50,000 on something. So 
great, great to see that. I was really excited to see that. And I think it looks really great still, the 500E for sure. Moving on from the auto show here, though, Lucid has two updates this week. So first they tease their new SUV called the Gravity, and they say it'll be by far the most aerodynamic SUV ever. And uh, it also looks to retain a similar look to the air, as you can see, just being stretched upward. And we got a few teaser images here of it. It'll be available with either two rows or three rows of seating. And their lead designer told Autoblog that cargo space is going to be off the charts and that they're taking packaging to a new level. And um, also performance should be on a new level as well here because um, it'll likely be getting a Sapphire version. They did allude to the fact that the Sapphire thing won't just be for the air, it will be on other stuff. And obviously that means it'll be on this as well, most likely. And so, I mean, the Sapphire Air does a 1.9 second zero to 60. Um, so if that's anything to go off of, the Gravity will easily be the fastest SUV on the planet, at least as far as accelerations go, um, you know, whenever it does come out. And so reservations for it will be open in early 2023, which is around when this should be revealed fully. Uh, and deliveries will begin sometime in 2024. But Great to see that. And on the other end of the spectrum, Lucid has also revealed the two more affordable trims of the Air this week, the Pure and the Touring. And considering the lowest price trim we had before now was the Grand Touring, that one costs over $150,000 still. So the Touring starting price here of just $108,900 uh, seems like a pretty good deal, especially considering it still has 620 horsepower, a 3.4 second zero to 60, and 425 miles of range. I mean, all three of those metrics are very impressive, you know, for, you know, a huge discount of you know, over $40,000. Uh, you know, I think that's something most people could certainly live with with that touring trim. Uh, but that's not all. Also, there's a new pure trim that starts 20 grand cheaper than that at just $88,900, including destination. And so that's if you can live with rear wheel drive and less power. They didn't reveal how much less power it'll have, but if you pay $5,500 more, you can get uh, uh, all wheel drive back again and that's that one they say will have 480 horsepower for a still very respectable 3.8 seconds zero to 60 time and 410 miles of range. And that one also, since it has less power, uh, it's also gonna have a smaller battery pack to help with that you know, lower cost. And so um, rear passengers are gonna be getting a lower floor for more foot space in those ones as well. And so they said they actually had to redesign um, the rear seat in order to uh, accommodate the lower position of your leg, considering the fact that your feet will be down lower with that lower uh, you know, uh, floor there. So that's an interesting little touch. And also it swaps the glass roof for a metal roof instead um, for that uh, pure version. And so those are all available to reserve now. So great to see them building out the lower end of the lineup as well, instead of just having all the crazy, you know, six figure stuff. So great to see that. Autocar this week has also learned some of the specs for the new Porsche Macan EV. Um, even though the car won't be debuting until 2024, it keeps getting delayed and pushed back because of other uh, you know, issues um, going on, I guess, behind the scenes there at, with that whole electric platform and the software. I suppose there's been a bunch of stories about that whole thing. But anyway, at least we have some specs here thanks to the auto, auto car here. So they're saying uh, when this thing does arrive, it's going to be pretty impressive, doing 603 horsepower and 738 pound-feet of torque, supposedly thanks to two electric motors and a 100 kilowatt hour battery. And there will be, of course, less powerful versions as well, but I think that's going to be, you know, the you know reveal version, the launch version, and that's typically, you know, the most impressive one these days. Um, and uh, also they did say that it will be on an 800 volt system to allow 270 kilowatt charging for a 10% to 80% charge in about 25 minutes as well. And it sounds like they're also focusing on good handling too, um, so much so that Ars Technica, another website, is reporting that it'll have a rear motor mounted behind the rear axle for a better 4852 front rear weight distribution. Um, so, I mean, that's a pretty extreme length to, you know, play around with where you're placing that motor to improve your weight distribution, but that's what they're doing here with this, supposedly. And it sounds like we'll get more details in 2023, but in the meantime, um, yeah, what they've revealed so far sounds very, very promising. And so, um, cool to hear that. And for the last news here this week, Acura has announced that the final NSX Type S has completed production and was built this week. And so with that, uh, the production of this generation NSX has officially ended. And so, you know, I know many people didn't like it, but I spent a week with one. I was very fortunate to spend a week with one and got to review it. And it was an amazing car. I really loved it. And I think that it was really ahead of its time. And it's just something that, you know, again, I've said this many times, but other car companies are now doing something similar to what the NSX did, you know, five years ago. 
and it's really commendable just how forward thinking the NSX was, I think. And so, yeah, I'm sad to see it go. And uh, we do know that a third generation has already been confirmed by Acura executives. They said it's coming back. It'll be coming back as an electric uh, you know, supercar though as well. And we also had a silhouette that was teased and I just actually discussed that a little bit last week. Um, so we do know it's coming back, but that'll likely be several years from now. Um, you know, it's gonna be a while probably. I think I even heard that could be like 2028 or something around then. So, I mean, it could be a good long while before we see another Acura supercar, which is another reason to be sad about this going away. Uh, but in the meantime, anyone who's curious, the Performance Manufacturing Center in Ohio that's building the NSX, that's, you know, a very impressive place, um, they will just continue building PMC editions. Maybe there will be something else for them to do. But for the foreseeable future, it sounds like they're just building PMC editions. Uh, the TLX Type S PMC edition is up next. They're doing 100 of those. And then we'll see what happens after that. I'm guessing maybe Integra Type S could be built there or something. I have no clue. But anyway, very interesting to, to hear about that. And Sad to see the NSX go, but it had a good run, went out with a bang with the Type S version, which unfortunately I haven't had a chance to drive still, but um, you know, seemed very, very impressive and uh, seemed like a good run for the NSX. Hopefully Acura is happy with how it did as well. And uh, so anyway, the last thing I wanna do is I'm gonna give a huge thank you to all of you who are members of the Matt Moran Motoring Club. So we didn't have any new members join this week, but I wanted to give a special shout out to Otto Octave, uh, who's been a member for over seven months now. And uh, so I hope you're enjoying the perks. I really appreciate the support. And for anyone else who would like to join, there's always a link in the description as well as buttons to join here on the uh, video page and on the channel page. But anyway, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this weekly update uh, live on location a bit. Let me know all your thoughts about all this stuff in the comments below. Thank you all very much for watching. Please, please also continue to like, comment, and subscribe uh, to continue to keep these videos coming. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.